everybody. Today we're going to discuss about two pillars which we consider critical for the evolution of the crypto space, at least in the short and medium run. So it's all about blockchain and uh, what's, it's, what's next, what is coming next. Uh, before we do that, I would like to introduce myself, I'm Yanis Menelao. Feel free to scan the QR codes, feel free to make as many photos as you like and post them on social media. Uh, I'm a faculty member of the University of Nicosia for the blockchain courses, and I'm also executive of LICIE, which is uh, a regulated institution and part of uh, a global Swiss blockchain group. So what is blockchain? We have discussed a lot about blockchain in the last two days, so I will not go deep into this. Generally, it's an autonomous trustless system which provides data in a public form. Other than that, of course, it's a buzzy word. Everybody talks about blockchain. But do you know which is the most buzzy word over the internet? Bitcoin, perhaps? Bitcoin Cash? Crypto? Nobody? And the most buzzy word on the internet is Trump at the moment. Thankfully, though, we are not going to discuss anything about politics. Uh, so let's move on with uh, the blockchain applications. So many think that blockchain system, a blockchain setup is essentially nothing more than serving financial transactions. Uh, it's simply an application. It's nothing more than that. A lot also think that using a blockchain is a great tool to do illicit actions, to do money laundering to provide access to illegal funding. Guess what? That's not true. Blockchain leaves traces, so if you have that uh, operation in mind, just stay away from that one. On the screen, you see a triangle, but that's not the triangle you know. When we design a network, we have those three pillars to take into consideration. How secure the network is going to be, if the network is going to be decentralized, and if it makes sense to the humans. And that's one of the problems we have with decentralized systems until today. And one of the major problems we face is the volatility in the markets. And this system, this trilemma, will help us understand how we can solve that through stable coins. So stable coins are actually crypto assets which maintain a stable value uh, against a target price, for example, the price of US dollar. We have seen a couple of nice uh, presentations about stable coins, and it's all about bringing stability in the market so we increase the global transactions. And when we try to design an appropriate stable coin, we have to understand the fundamentals of money. So what is, which are the good properties of money? Obviously, store of value. It has to have some value. It has to be easy to be exchanged, i.e. it has to be divisible, it has to be fungible, it has to be portable, and so on. Also, we all know that it has to have, to have some value. It's a unit of account and all the other functionalities. We are referring to crypto, so it has to be uh, the privacy and the security has to be uh, increased, it's censorship resistant, and we also have the network effect and the scalability, which is a big issue for the existing cryptos. We care about uh, cryptocurrencies and we refer to stable coins. Why do we do that? because the traditional means, like the fiat currencies, and even the cryptocurrencies, as we're going to see in a bit, they do not offer basic things, the basic properties of good money. And for example, did you know that every 27 years, generally there is a change in the traditional currency of a country? And did you also know that a quarter of the global currencies uh, a monetary reform in a period of their, life, their lifespan, which is roughly 24, 
27 years. And down to the right bottom, you can also see one of the latest currency failures we have, which is uh, the Venezuela uh, currency, and it's going to uh, the bottom. And if you consider, or if you think that currency failures exist only on currencies coming from less developed economies, then you are misled. Let's have a look at the case of US dollar. US dollar has some nice properties. Uh, we all like to use US dollar for global transactions. 63% of the global reserves is actually in US dollars. It's also the most popular payment method. Uh, more than 50% of the SWIFT payments, i.e. the payments uh, between banks, are done on US dollar and settled on US dollar. And generally speaking, just to be fair with the dollar, when we do daily transactions, i.e. Uh, short-term volatility is quite low. But did you also know that dollar every 20 years becomes uh, half, its value becomes half. And we're referring to the most dominant uh, currency. Also, if we also like to integrate the functionalities of uh, the cryptos, we can debate and say that uh, US dollar, it's a centralized currency, uh, it's not private, it's not resistant, and so on. We also have problems with the traditional cryptocurrencies. Uh, and recently, we experienced many of those. We had a lot of uh, crashes, a lot of bubbles. Uh, we had the euphoria investing into several ICOs. And we have also more traditional problems with the cryptos, like uh, the emission pro problem while we, we mine. Also, we had the congestion on the different networks. Uh, especially last year when everybody was trying to invest in ICOs, everyone was issuing new tokens. Uh, and also we have the problem of scalability, which in, which in a few places and in few occasions that can be overcome. And we see a lot of new blockchain applications trying to solve that. The good thing about cryptocurrencies is that uh, they, it seems they are getting adopted in a mass uh, way. And we can also easily measure the possibility of risks and any tail risks uh, which may exist. So if any hacking activity may happen, we can more or less uh, predefine it. So we have all of those complexities with the traditional currencies and with the cryptocurrencies. So there is need of having uh, stable coins. Um, and the most dominant uh, fundamental of a stable coin, obviously, is the price stability. Uh, and, of course, it would be nice, and that's something we spend a lot of time researching about it, uh, if a stable coin has some more functionality, like a fiat gateway, which is critical, uh, pegging a currency, a stable coin, to the price of dollar, obviously, uh, is critical. So generally, we have three forms of uh, stable coins. On the internet, if you search, you may find four forms of stable coins, but generally those can be classified uh, under the second category. We can split it and have two separate categories. So the most common ones, like Tether, it's uh, nothing more than a centralized uh, offering, which is, at the end of the day, an IOU. Um, and then we have the decentralized applications and the stable coins, which is uh, very promising uh, technology to see how it will evolve. Now, the second topic I would like to discuss with you, because we run a crypto exchange, we run regular institutions, and we care a lot about uh, regulation. We speak with regulators across over, over the globe, and uh, we face some issues, but there are also some good news. So regulators came to play an active role back in 2013, some of them, but the euphoria of the regulation started in 2016. Everybody, all of the regulators were trying to understand, trying to regulate uh, uh, cryptocurrencies and cryptocurrency operations, but that was kind of impossible, I would say, uh, over that period of time. 
Last year, we had the famous bubble of the ICOs. The price were inflated uh, by a lot. No fundamentals behind, behind it. It was simply euphoria investing all of those ICOs. Uh, and the regulators came to play an active role. How regulation is evolved, and that is evolved, in my understanding, in two ways. By providing some regulatory sandboxes and by collaboration between the several regulators. And it's nice to see that uh, that study from uh, Cambridge that uh, tracks all the regulatory sandboxes in relation to fintech, which exist uh, globally. Uh, it's fair to say, though, that if you are registered, if you register your institution under the regulatory sandbox, uh, you are not, in most cases, you are not allowed to register your company as a financial institution. So you have the flexibility to play around, to innovate, to create good things, but you are not able or to apply to become a financial institution, a regulated financial institution, for example, a payment provider at the same time. So uh, it's good to have those regulations and that kind of uh, understanding from the regulators, but please go and study before uh, you apply for those sandboxes. So the second way regulation is coming into the industry is via uh, the regulatory collaboration, and we welcome that kind of approach because it, it provides uh, an efficiency in the way regulation is going to come, and it's more open to the public. Uh, that started a bit before 2017, but in 2017 we have the first study from Cambridge uh, describing exactly this, and we can see if we compare it with 2018, uh, the evolution of the regulatory approach for the whole fintech industry, not only for the cryptos. Uh, and it's worth mentioning that the collaboration in Asia is quite fostering, and we may see some regulation coming first, some more advanced regulation than the current regulations uh, to come first in Asia. And I will give you some examples of uh, regulation which exist uh, in the States, in Europe, and so on. And although these are the good news, the bad news is that we still don't see a clear understanding from the regulators. And each regulator is having its own approach, even until today, and even uh, when we see all of, those, uh, all of that good collaboration. So for example, in the UK, <coughs> We have a more open approach uh, where the government is actually monitoring, closely monitoring the crypto transactions, the crypto operations. Uh, the government is willing to help. Uh, they acknowledge and understand that there are risks related to the crypto operations, uh, but they do not push the companies out of the business. In Switzerland, things are also quite clear, uh, not everything, but at least there are guidelines and directions, for example, for the ICOs and the tokens. Uh, and in the US, it's a kindly more aggressive approach where the laws were adjusted, were amended, and if you deal with, uh, or if there is possibility of dealing with any crypto operations, it's better if you go to the regulator and get their approval in advance. Unfortunately, in Europe, things are a bit more complicated, as you see from uh, the regulation. Uh, there are still no clear guidelines on the virtual currencies or on the cryptos. Yes, there are guidelines on the virtual currency uh, CFTs, which are treated as financial instruments. But in terms of blockchain or crypto operations, there are still no clear uh, directions. Uh, although we had the initiative from Malta recently and Estonia. So blockchain, it's a global platform of, of trust where we can use it having regulation, having stable coins, and it fosters evolu evolution and innovation in the space. And of course, uh, it provides uh, transparency to our personal and private data, uh, and it helps us avoid failures of the past. So let's embrace blockchain and make fintech better. Thank you.